I wanted to talk today about Rabbi Lamb's views on uh, religious Zionism and Messianic Zionism. And then I want to start a conversation about Rabbi Lamb's view of the value of secular studies, which is with little doubt um, Rabbi Lamb's most famous book called Torah Umada, his elaborate defense of the value of secular studies in um, uh, the rabbinic uh, mind. But I think that the two topics, religious Zionism and um, Torah Umada, intermix in interesting ways that are reflective of the reality that Rabbi Lamb uh, grew up in and thought about. Rabbi Lamb was born in the um, um, in um, the late 1920s, and like all the rest of us, is to some extent an intellectual product of uh, his time. You can't avoid that. We all are. Um, essentially, as I sort of start every one of these classes, I find Rabbi Lamb to be a very, very impressive person. On the whole, um, Rabbi Lamb was four things, and the four things are, uh, uh, are very impressive. He was an enormous scholar of um, 20 books and hundreds of articles. He was a religious leader. He was a religious leader in the classical sense, a person who gave shirim and provided religious direction and thought overtly and comfortably about the religious problems in our community. He was a communal leader in the sense of he not only thought religiously about institutions, he was comfortable serving as um, the lay head of these institutions. Uh, moving them in all sorts of fascinating ways, building things that weren't there, um, asking what's missing from our community. Those are beyond the function of a mere religious leader. He was a communal leader. Um, and Rabbi Lamb was, as I've grown comfortable calling him repeatedly over the course of these classes, an, in, an intellectual dis diplomat. He was a person who by his very nature sought to understand many sides of complex issues and um, address these complexities by crafting intellectual compromises um, that weren't fully accepted by everybody, um, but were um, widely accepted um, as an admirable attempt um, to bridge the gap in the middle. Rabbi Lamb was a centrist, not just in the political sense, but in the sense that when Rabbi Lamb saw two approaches to a hard issue, he recognized that the truth of these two, of the, of the truth wasn't found by resolving this dispute. The truth was resolved by closely studying these two camps and taking the best of these two camps and putting them together. That was, a, uh, the Rabbi Salvatic's code word for this was a dialectic tension, but Rabbi Lamb, I think, understood it was something even better than that. It was a recognition of the fact that when the universe was painted as black by some and white by others, um, the truth was that it was probably gray, um, and it might even be pink, um, or some other shade that hovers between a black and white, and that when really, really, really smart people boil things down to two choices. Actually, every point between these two choices is also a viable option. And Rabbi Lamb liked to see the truth in compromise and not the truth in the stark determination of, of this camp is correct and this camp is incorrect. And um, and we spent our various classes focusing on different aspects of this. But, you know, I have not spent these classes focusing on Rabbi Lamb as a religious leader or a communal leader. But instead, I have spent my time focusing on Rabbi Lamb as the scholar. And I want to highlight Rabbi Lamb's formulation of intellectual compromise as a discipline 
in and of itself. You could almost think of Rabbi Lamb as a second tier scholar in all the best senses of the word, which is Rabbi Lamb let others forge ahead and do groundbreaking work and Rabbi Lamb would follow up synthesizing the various views into a position that actually made sense and that involved a certain amount of give and take between the different ideologies, but produced an outcome um, that worked very, very, very well in um, the real world. We saw this in Rabbi Lamb's um, uh, work on confessions and halacha, and Rabbi Lamb's work on ecology and halacha. We saw this in Rabbi Lamb's honest dealings with the strengths and weaknesses of Satmar. Um, we saw it in Rabbi Lamb's um, a, a interesting formulation of how to deal with life on other planets. Um, we saw it in Rabbi Lamb's reading on marriage, sexuality, and homosexuality um, with Rabbi Lamb's neat way to synthesize um, drush and halacha. And um, last week, um, we discussed Rabbi Lamb's um, nuanced way of thinking about the role and place of women in Judaism, which was also really a synthesis of two competing views. This week, we discussed religious Zionism, Messianic Zionism, and its relationship to Rabbi Norman Lamb's view of Torah Umada, secular studies. It's well known around yeshiva, and Rabbi Lamb put it in writing many times that um, Rabbi Lamb was not um, the most fervent and ardent religious Zionist in the institution. He didn't necessarily see the hand of God in the reestablishment of the state of Israel. He hesitated mightily to think about the Six Day War in a miraculous way. Um, he was happy, content in a deeply important way to see the reestablishment of the state of Israel as a central um, religious landmark of Jewry. But um, when you asked Rabbi Lamb to tell you what God thought of the reestablishment of the state of Israel, he hesitated to talk in God's name. As I published shortly after Rabbi Lamb died, a letter he wrote to me when the young Israel of Toko Hills um, uh, started playing music on Yom Atzmaut, which was then unheard of in the beautiful city of Atlanta, Rabbi Lamb went out of his way to justify the playing of live music on Yom Atzmaut with no reference to any miracles in the reestablishment of the state of Israel or in the Six Day War. He was not a believer in um, what the disciples of Rav Kook call the key Vamoed theory of religious Zionism. Our time has arrived and God will do repeated miracles for us in order to ensure the survival of the state. He was happy um, to contemplate the possibility that the state of Israel lived miraculously, but he was equally happy to contemplate the possibility that the state of Israel survived because of the wits of its leaders uh, and the faithfulness of its community with no reference um, to any miracles at all. He, he hesitated in every way he could um, to make um, religious Zionism messianic Zionism. Indeed, he was not a big fan of our prayer for the state of Israel. Um, he liked and he instituted in the Manhattan Jewish Center when he was the rabbi, um, a different prayer for the state of Israel, what he called the British prayer, which was the prayer written by Chief Rabbi Brody in 1948, which um, made no mention of Reshit Svichat Ke'ulatenu, that the reestablishment of the state of Israel was the beginning of our redemption. And when you asked him why, he said, it is less ideologically demanding it makes no assumptions about the messianic nature of Israel. Thus, even those who are hesitant about committing themselves to clear knowledge of our position in God's redemptive process can join in thanksgiving for the benevolence in establishing our national dignity. This is vintage Rabbi Lamb's religious Zionism. Rabbi Lamb thought 
that the reestablishment of Jewish sovereignty in the state of Israel was the divine plan that we should be sovereign somewhere. It was necessary to envision the Jewish people as um, having a Jewish homeland, and it established national dignity after the Holocaust, where it was made clear we were unwanted everywhere, we were wanted here. And this is very important to Rabbi Lamb. When you say to him, when you said to him, was there a promise on God's part that the reestablished state of Israel will not fall? He said, no. And when you said to him, should we engage in um, uh, poor policymaking, confident in the fact that God will, if you'll excuse me, save our bacon. Um, <coughs> Rabbi Lamb said, bad idea. Um, God has given us no promise that he will save our bacon in any way, shape, or form. Indeed, God, Rabbi Lamb's point is very astute. God never made that promise even when there was a base to make that. And he certainly hadn't made that promise now. Um, the state of Israel, in Rabbi Lamb's view, was an unmitigatingly positive thing. It was wonderful and good and proper and needed and worthwhile, but it wasn't in any way, shape, or form a manifestation of the divine will necessarily, and um, it wasn't in any way, shape, or form um, predicated on God's promise to us that our time has arrived. He affirmatively rejected what he, you could reasonably read as um, Rabbi Soloveitchik's read, which is the reestablishment of the state of Israel was a divine reward for the Holocaust. Um, Rabbi Lamb hesitated to see the Holocaust as a punishment from God, and he hesitated to see the reestablishment of the state of Israel as a reward by God from surviving the Holocaust. He was inclined instead not to see the Holocaust as coming from God, and he was happy not to see the reestablishment of the state of Israel as coming from God either. This stands in such intense contrast to most of the theologians of the 20th century, from Eliezer Berkowitz to Rabbi Soloveitchik to Rabbi Sachs, um, all of whom uh, saw the reestablishment of the state of Israel as relating in some way to the Holocaust. God punished us in the Holocaust and rewarded us with the reestablishment of the state of Israel. Um, and, and they like to see this dichotomy in that exact way um, because um, it allowed some sort of contrast here um, between these two. I'm not Rabbi Lamb. Rabbi Lamb didn't see God in the Holocaust, and he didn't see God in the reestablishment of the state of Israel. He thought that our mission as God's children, our mission as God's children was to reestablish sovereignty and um, to build um, a perfect state in um, the place that God gave us, and that this was part of our mission of being an orla goyim, a light onto the nations, but he didn't see the hand of God. As far as I can tell, in the 1950s and the 1960s, he and Rabbi Emanuel Rachman, who's also worthy of a 10-part series of classes, um, diligently defended that view against many others, left, right, and center. There was the group of religious Zionists led by Rabbi Soloveitchik, who saw the reestablishment of the state of Israel in miraculous terms. And then there were the critics of the state of Israel to the right of Israel, who saw the reestablishment of the state of Israel in demonic terms, like Rabbi Lamb explained the Satmar. But Rabbi Lamb was in neither of these two camps. He and Rabbi Rachman diligently presented the reestablishment of the state of Israel as God's mission to us um, was um, to build a state that ran itself consistent with halacha 
and that ran itself in a way that was a sanctification of God's name, but it wasn't predicated on God's existence. Elliot Royston sent me a, a text, a, a group chat, which you can't read because he sent it only to me. He asked me, could Rabbi Lamb um, call, uh, be called a secular Zionist? And the answer is not the way we use the term. We use the term a secular Zionist to believe that there is no God and um, that Zionism is a nationalistic movement like uh, uh, moving to Ireland or Poland. Rabbi Lamb adamantly believed there was a God. He adamantly believed that God called upon us to live in the Jewish homeland. He adamantly believed that God called upon us to establish a just state in the homeland governed by halacha. He was a religious Zionist through and through because he perceived it important that we be in Israel and not in Uganda, we be in Israel and not in Iceland, we be in Israel and um, not in the Jewish Democratic Republic of Slovakia. Um, it was Israel that God wanted us to be in. So he wasn't secular the way we perceive of secular Zionists, which is even if there is no God, we want to be here. But what Rabbi Lamb was, was convinced um, that the way we conducted ourselves in Israel was not predicated on the idea that God miraculously put us there um, and that God would keep us behaving, um, keep us going by behaving miraculously through and through. Not at all. Um, Rabbi Lamb's basic point was that just because God wants us to do something, doesn't mean that God is prepared to do miracles to make that happen. I once heard Rabbi Lamb say as follows, God wants us to eat matzah on Pesach, but yet we don't wait for matzah to fall from heaven to eat it on Pesach. We harvest the grain, we beat it into flour, and we make our own matzah. The fact that there is a miracle, the fact that there is an obligation to do something does not concomitantly produce the idea that God miraculously assists us in performing um, God's mitzvot. God's mitzvot are ever present to us and they motivate us. But when somebody says to me, I had a very hard time getting matzah and then a miracle happened and I found $12 on the street and then I ran to buy matzah, we recognize that the term miracle in that context might not really mean a miracle, it might just mean a really nice thing happened. Rabbi Lamb's point here is very, very important. Um, Messianic Zionism perceives the direct hand of God in the reestablishment of the State of Israel in 1948. It perceives the direct hand of God in the conquest during the Six Day War and it perceives God's ongoing involvement in the state of Israel to keep it going. Rabbi Lamb categorically denied um, that idea. Um, he categorically denied the idea that um, you have to believe that there was a miracle in the 48 war. Um, he categorically denied that you had to believe there was a miracle in the Six Day War, when you pressed him about saying Hallel, he was a happy sayer of Hallel. And when you asked him why, he said, um, the saying of Hallel is not because a true miracle happened. The saying of Hallel is driven by the idea that when something incredibly, incredibly good happens to us, we say Hallel. Hallel is recited because of the depths of the thanksgiving rather than um, because of the centrality of the miracle. This is a very important religious idea that um, Rabbi Lamb really, really, really liked to reinforce. The state of Israel is good for us, Rabbi Lamb felt. The reestablishment of Jewish sovereignty in Israel um, should make us all feel like we are re religious Zionists. 
We should support the state of Israel in every way we can. But if you think that you can engage in irrational policy planning because God will save you, because God is ongoingly involved, he felt that that was not true. And every time he heard it, he cringed. And he felt that the long-term idea of um, God with God's miracles will ensure our survival, Rabbi Lamb felt inevitably jeopardized the state of Israel because it encouraged irrational planning. If I genuinely believe I'm wearing a bulletproof vest and that bulletproof vest is God, um, then I'm more inclined to risk being shot at because I've got a divine bulletproof vest. It's the awareness of the fact that I don't have a bulletproof vest and I need to make very good plans to make sure nothing terrible happens to me that drove Rabbi Lamb far, far, far away from the Messianic Zionism that I think Rabbi Lamb would say he grew up on um, in the United States and in um, the early reestablishment of the state of Israel, where there was this breathtaking sense of one miracle after another. Rabbi Lamb and Rabbi Rachman repeatedly in the 50s sought to deny um, that an overt miracle had taken place. Um, when you ask them about covert miracles, they were happy to say to you, if you see them, you should be grateful, but if you don't see them, you don't have to be grateful. And Rabbi Lamb loved to highlight when you pressed him on how the military historians writing books about Israel's war of liberation in 1948 expressed it in cold, calculating military economic terms. The Jews were on the defensive. They were well organized. They were well trained. They were well armed. He didn't say that you have to see the victory in 1948 as God rushing to our defense. In that sense, Eliot, um, Rabbi Lamb was a secular Zionist in the following sense. He thought that the state of Israel could not rely on God to protect it. It had to engage in calm and dispassionate planning to make sure of its survivability. And Rabbi Lamb really hit his stride when he um, spoke very forcefully after the great victories of the Six Day War on the need to make peace with Israel's neighbors. And eventually, by the way, Rabbi Lamb was the person who drove the Rav to speak so intensely after the Six Day War. Everybody knows. And you can read about it in the internet, and you can even listen to the speech on YouTube, that in 1967, Rabbi Soloveitchik stood up and said he has a fear, which is the Israelis will turn down a good peace deal um, because they're so overwhelmed with a sense of victory that they can never be defeated. And he, Rabbi Soloveitchik, wants to say publicly that they should even return Jerusalem for peace um, if that it brings about genuine peace. Rabbi Lamb saw very intensely that a perpetual war in Israel um, was an unsustainable way to think about things and that Israel had to strive for peace, had to seek out international support, had to live with alliances and could not adopt the view that it was a godly island all to itself, which was independent of the will of the nations, because God would support us no matter what we did. That was not Rabbi Lamb's model. Rabbi Lamb's model focused on, thank God for his benevolence in reestablishing our national giving, our national uh, dignity to recognize that the Jewish people had gone from uh, losing to winning and that we thank God every time we go from losing to winning because that's the way religious people conduct themselves. And of course, Rabbi Lamb was as happy as anybody else to hear about the miracles. But when you pressed him, he didn't really believe that the state of Israel survived based on miracles. He believed the state of Israel survived based on its wits. And we thank God every day for giving us the wits to allow us to survive. Um, this is consistent with one of the basic themes of Rabbi Norman Lamb's worldview. We do God's bidding. 
And we were put on this earth to follow God's game plan, but we have little ability to actually discern what's on God's mind. This is a consistent theme of Rabbi Lamb. He hated listening to people who told him what God really intended. He had little patience for people who told him why the Holocaust happened. Um, and he had little patience for people who told him um, how come God supported the establishment of the state of Israel or any other predictor uh, or any other uh, teller of God's will. He thought that our mission was to do God's dictates in this world. And when you pressed us, we said as follows, we know what God expects of us. We don't know what God expects of God. And we don't have a clear ideological commitment to how God will conduct himself. We are establishing the state of Israel in this case, because that's what God instructed us to do. It doesn't flow from that, that God has promised to support us no matter what. God's ways are mysterious and um, we exist. Um, and we conduct ourselves independent of the idea that we know for certain what really is um, God's will. Determining God's true plan is impossible, but God's will and direction for us can be determined even as we have no real way to determine God's will and direction for God, not our place and not important for us to do. I wanna start talking now about how Rabbi Lamb's vision of religious Zionism eventually led Rabbi Lamb to an elaborate detailed explanation of the relationship between Jewish studies and secular studies, which is what we're gonna spend next week um, discussing. What Rabbi Lamb's maybe most famous book is called Torah Umada. What Rabbi Lamb saw in his version of religious Zionism was a deep recognition of the fact that very good things come from secular people and that um, there is deep wisdom among the non-Jews and there's deep wisdom among the secular Jews. When you asked Rabbi Lamb who led the establishment of the state of Israel, he was happy to tell you that it was Herzl and Trumpeldor and a whole cadre of religious Zion, of secular Zionists um, in the early part of the 20th century. And when you asked him, how could something so good come from people who were essentially not observant at all? Rabbi Lamb um, said something very important. You should never think that all the good things in the world definitionally come from rabbinic Jews. He didn't feel that way. He felt that um, uh, good things, secular knowledge, um, uh, even religious ideals could come from people who were not observant of Jewish law at all. This produces, and we'll discuss next week at great length, um, Rabbi Lamb's book on secular knowledge, but at its core, um, the kind of religious Zionism that Rabbi Lamb believed in, which is a religious Zionism in which God tells us to inhabit the land of Israel and do the best we can in a hard situation and in a complex way, that produces the following idea. Who should lead us in the state of Israel? The most qualified leader. And what do I do if, if perchance the most qualified leader is not orthodox? Let him lead anyway, because what we really need in this situation is exquisitely well done people leading in the best way that they can. Rabbi Lamb diligently resisted Chief Rabbi Herzog, the first chief rabbi of the state of Israel's 
desire to label the government of the state of Israel with some rabbinic category like Malchai Yisrael. Rabbi Lamb thought that was a terrible idea. He didn't believe in that. He thought instead um, that the state of Israel could and was led by secular Jews. And it was extremely important to acknowledge that they did a fantastic job leading the state of Israel, and that not only was there yesh chachma bagoyim, there was value among the non-Jews, Rabbi Lamb felt yesh chachma bachilonim. There's a lot of things of enormous value among the secular people. In this sense, Rabbi Lamb profoundly shared Rabbi Cook's idea, which is the secular people who were settling the land of Israel um, were smart, astute, shrewd, worthwhile, and, and er, had earned the right to lead by dint of their successfully leading until this moment. And when you propose to Rabbi Lamb <laughs> that wouldn't it be a better idea if the prime minister was religious, Rabbi Lamb said, wouldn't it be a better idea if the prime minister was even more astute and could see even farther over the horizon? Um, Rabbi Lamb's point is very important here. Rabbi Lamb's vision of religious Zionism leads or bleeds into Rabbi Lamb's vision of the value of all things secular. He thinks that the secular community can contribute enormously to the state of Israel precisely because um, while the state of Israel should be led to halacha, it is not being led by God and religious Jews are not entitled to lead it. It's not a synagogue, it's a nation, Rabbi Lamb felt. And this produces a different version of religious Zionism from the kind of religious Zionism that the chief rabbinate of Israel always articulated. The times I met with the various chief rabbis here and there, you always got a sense that they thought of themselves as the political leadership of the religious community. And they wondered why they weren't prime minister. Um, and Rabbi Lamb understood very well why they weren't prime minister. They weren't prime minister because um, leadership in our community is intrinsically secular, and that secular leadership is a good thing because neither the religious leadership nor the secular leadership has a channel to God. If you, uh, for the state of Israel, if you perceive the state of Israel as surviving based on ongoing miracles by God, then you perceive the best people to lead the state of Israel to be the most pious and holy because those are the people most likely to get miracles from God. On the other hand, if you perceive the state of Israel as surviving based on its wits without any commitment by, um, by God, um, then Rabbi Lamb's answer goes is that I want the leadership that has the tallest wits and the most astute um, predictions of the future. Uh, David Blumenthal says Rabbi Lamb seems to have stayed away from interpreting the doctrine of providence from all the subjects I dealt with. I totally agree with that. Rabbi Lamb thought very strongly that it was an act of hubris um, for human beings to determine what really God intended to do. Um, Rabbi Lamb uh, thought that we could tell you what God wanted of us, and that that was a mixture of halacha, hashkafa, and philosophy, but at no point did we have an expression of what God, what we expected from God, or um, an assurance that God would act in a certain way. This produces an idea of um, the power of practical ideas in the state of Israel. Rabbi Lamb throughout his long career, um, supported practical steps to make Israel 
stronger. I'll step into one of Rabbi Lamb's most controversial moments and go back to last week's class on sexual ethics, two weeks ago. Um, in the mid-1980s, when I was a student at Yeshiva, a long time ago when I was tall and skinny and didn't have a beard, um, in those good old days, um, there was a group of people that wanted to march under um, the Gays for Israel band in the Salute to Israel Day Parade. And all the people in the right said, this is terrible, terrible, terrible. We don't want that. We don't want that. And Rabbi Lamb worked very, very, very hard to broker compromise in this situation. He thought that Israel was better served with broad and wide support from the gay community, from the Orthodox Jewish community. And when you said to him, but God will frown on us if we have a thriving gay community, Rabbi Lamb said, how do you know that? How do you know that? Um, that it's a sin, we know. But how do you know that God's providence is what's preserving the state of Israel? How do you know that God's going to frown on it? Rabbi Lamb was more inclined, uh, actually, if you read closely what he writes, to what we now call the pinkwashing theory of Israel. He thought it was very important that Israel engage in a PR campaign that demonizes the Arab world and that that would form practical political points. And part of those practical political points was demonstrating that Israel was a Western democratic state with respect to the rights of minorities, including the rights of the same-sex community. Um, Rabbi Lamb refused to get enmeshed in a conversation about what God, how God will respond to a gay pride parade in Israel or in America. He thought that it was beyond our ability to successfully think about how God reacted to things. We could explain how we reacted to things, for sure. But we could not explain, and we should not build our policies around the question of how God um, will react to the things that we do. We conduct ourselves in accordance with the Torah and the mitzvot. Um, we uh, assume that God rewards us for our good conduct in Torah and mitzvot. We continue to faithfully push Torah and mitzvot, but we don't commitment that our agenda is God's agenda in any way, shape, or form. This is an important idea, and it produces Rabbi Lamb's vision of religious Zionism. I remember when the Young Israel got started, and I had a long conversation with Rabbi Lamb about uh, bringing live music into the Atlanta area. In those good old days, also when I was tall and skinny, um, a long time ago in 1995, um, when we first introduced live music on Yom Mood, and there was a great deal of rabbinic opposition, Rabbi Lamb said as follows, we, we play live music on Yom Mood because we feel gratitude towards God, nothing more and nothing less. It's our gratitude that generates this license and not um, any commitment on God's part that God is happy or that God will um, protect us. Um, it's a very, very good idea. He was, as Elliot said, he was um, wise. And Rhonda said as follows, pragmatic. I found Rabbi Lamb. It's not just pragmatic in the, in the Bill Clinton sense of triangulate your enemies. Bill Clinton was extremely pragmatic. Rabbi Lamb was humble. When you said to him, I'm going to speak in the name of God here, and having channeled God's will, it will be self-explanatory to you as to what you should do, Rabbi Lamb immediately rolled his eyeballs and thought that none of us, not him, not you, not me, channeled God, and that um, what we're supposed to be doing is examining the mitzvot to determine what we should do and doing it and not channeling God in any way, shape, or form. This produces Rabbi Lamb's pragmatic religious Zionism. Rabbi Lamb sort of said you have to be uh, dense not to see religious Zionism in the Torah. We pray all the time to return to the land of Israel. We, um, all of these different things. Rabbi Lamb's 
saw the centrality of the land of Israel in God's commandments to us. But when you said to him, because it was central in God's commandments to us, it, you are sure that God will protect us as we are reestablishing the land of Israel. Rabbi Lamb said, where did you get that second step from? It wasn't true. And in the mid-1980s, when there was a long conversation about trying to establish a yeshiva university in Israel, still sort of very interesting that here we are, um, 70 years into the establishment of the state of Israel, and there's no Torah institution in Israel that teaches secular studies, and no secular studies institution that's geared towards the Orthodox. bar Ilan is not now and never was that institution. Maybe Machon Lev is now in a very narrow sense. But Rabbi Lamb, when you asked him, he said it's a good idea in theory, but given the reality in Israel, it won't work in practice. And it's important not to embark on religiously worthwhile, but obviously unsuccessful ideas, because it violated one's sense of how one should go about doing things. Next week, I'm going to spend time on Rabbi Lamb's magnum opus. Rabbi Lamb's magnum opus is his work, Torah Umada, which is the multi-chaptered exploration of the relationship between Jewish law and all things secular. And we'll use this as an opportunity um, to think about that most important part of Rabbi Lamb's life. He led the institution that uh, preached this for many, many, many years. He deeply personally believed in it. But I think his basic insights into Torah Umada derive from, or at least coexist with, his basic insights into religious Zionism. Good to see everybody. Uh, next week, we're going to spend our time on Rabbi Lamb's book called Torah Umada, That's which you good. can buy on the cheap at Amazon now. Um, and it's a book worth having and owning. And then the week after that, we'll have a broader conversation about Rabbi Lamb's theology. And I'll try to get Shalom Lamb to come on and talk a little bit about memories of his father. Great, or, great. Yeah, uh, Josh Lamb. All of that would be wonderful. Okay, great. good to hear from you all. It's good to talk to you.